Uh-huh. I'm going to share a little something with you guys right now. So just to get us uh, while we're waiting here, just to take a look at this is the, uh, the Conti ransomware groups leak site. So this is them live. Um, we're currently dealing with them. I, could, I would show you the chat, but uh, it's got client names and stuff in it. So that would be bad. <laughs> Yeah, I probably don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, this is theirs. You guys could take a look at it, and this is this is what they do uh, when there's a leak. This is what it looks like. Uh-huh. Just yeah. let me know when you guys are ready to get going here, and I'll I'll, I'll throw out the presentation. We'll do some chat. Okay. Yeah, I think we are. And I, Keith, actually, I was going. Do you mind if we record the presentation and put it on YouTube? Uh, oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, good. And Ryan, I still have to post yours if you're good with that from last one. Yeah. Okay. So I'll get those uh, hopefully this weekend and I'll get those out there. Um, so I know a lot of folks that weren't able to attend Ryan's last month and, and uh, I know there's some folks that aren't going to be able to make it today, but still want to, to be able to watch the presentation. So I appreciate that for, for you guys letting us share. So without further ado, then uh, I don't, Ryan, do you want to give uh, Keith a little introduction or... Sure, I'll do that. Uh, glad to be with everyone today. Um, I have my colleague and coworker Keith Swanson with us. Uh, Keith is former law enforcement, used to work on the, the Secret Service Task Force, now works uh, at Kivu with myself. He's one of our directors of incident response, and he leads our counterintelligence um, and extortion team. So we thought this would be, you know, a really timely, a very timely presentation now after the uh, events of last weekend um, and then you know we're about a month out from month and a half out I think or so from Colonial Pipeline and we've seen a lot of changes happen in the environment so we're just going to go through some of those trends of what's been what we're seeing um, hopefully you know some of this information is obviously useful and helpful to you all and your organizations um, and being prepared for that potential next big moment um, that comes up so uh, with that just turn it over to Keith Thanks, Ryan. Um, as you guys can see, I put this up here. You know, this is live this morning, uh, Conti's uh, league site, and that's what we're up against. Let me, uh, we'll, we'll switch over to uh, the uh, presentation, and we'll, uh, we'll start going through that, guys, and then we'll get it going. It's, um, we're just going to talk about some of the changes that have been going on in the ransomware and some of the different tools. A lot of this may be repeat for some of you guys, but it's always good just to, you know, there's so much going on in the world just to kind of go through everything again. So basically, we, we started in 2009. Uh, we focus on the cyber insurance incident response, and we, have, we get involved in a, just about everything. Any, any kind of breach, uh, a lot of ransomware work, that's our bread and butter. Um, just to, you know, expert witness testimony, everything. We have offices in Europe and uh, here in the States. Uh, we got people all over the country. Um, we can bring resources to bear rather quickly. Um, not only do we do uh, investigations and forensics and, and, and ransomware and all that stuff, we also have a post breach recovery team, remediation recovery team, which can give you guys extra hands on on a scene. Lord knows uh, when doing these things goes down, there's a lot of Red Bull and Monster being uh, being consumed, and we can provide some help. These guys go in, they rebuilt everything from a two person from mom and pop shop up to giant universities. So they've got a lot of resources that we can bring to you guys. Me, like Ryan said, I'm an old, I'm an old retired detective. Um, I had 26 years in law enforcement, and uh, one day, and obviously uh, I'm a lot older than that picture. I need to get a new headshot, Ryan. Um, one day, the lieutenant walks in and says, "Hey, you know things about computers. We're going to put you in this computer forensics team, computer crimes unit. We're going to be doing." And I'm like, uh, "Okay." And that started all of this. Um, after my retirement, I went to work for both uh, CBS Health and an American Express Global Business Travel in these large enterprise environments. Uh, CVS at that time, we had 660,000 endpoints, a um, lot of fun, a uh, lot, of, lot of late nights and a lot of things going on there. And American Express uh, Global Business Travel, we were actually spinning off of the larger American Express uh, organization. So we built an entire security program there from scratch. And then I ended up coming here to Kivu. Uh, I've arrested hackers um, as part of the Secret Service Task Force. We have done interstate fraud, hacking just about anything. We've, I've sat in the room, we've interviewed these guys. Um, we've had an opportunity to get a lot of different intelligence from these guys from the Fed. Um, you know, just a ton of information. It's actually was one of the best experiences in my career, uh, you know, hanging out with those guys and, and, and being able to participate 
in many of their functions. Uh, I even got to do a little bit of protection one time. That was interesting as heck. So it was, uh, it, can't say anything bad about my, my career. It's, it's been long and there's bags under the eyes, but it, you know, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Let's talk about the threat landscape. The Colonial Pipeline and Dark Side deal has taken the threat landscape and turned it upside down, okay? We all have seen the stuff on, on, on the news. This thing had more press than pretty much any ransomware attack we've seen in a long time. Uh, what happened was on May 7th, Darkseid got into these guys. Darkseid uses a different, different tactics. They love RDP. If they find an RDP port, boom, they're on it. But they'll, they use different. They're not against using phishing emails or anything like that. So they get into Colonial, Par uh, Colonial Pipeline on May 7th. Darkseid uh, uses a rather uh, extensive, I think it's RSA encryption and they customize keys for each of their victims. So there's no universal decryptor for a dark side. Uh, the ransom in this case here ended up being paid was 4.4 million. And the, the poor president and CEO of Colonial Pipeline was stuck between a decision. Do I pay the ransom or I can't get my pipeline back up and running for over a month? Pay, get the pipeline. So really fuel prices, I, I live in Arizona and the effect on fuel prices out here from this event was when we were feeling it out here, they were rising out here. We're not even on the colonial pipeline. So he made the ultimate decision to pay the rents. So FBI gets involved. Um, anytime you touch big oil or anything like that, there's, you're going to get a lot of attention and dark side kind of screwed up here. So the, the bureau gets involved and they got into and seized dark side servers. And they ended up finding a private key to a Bitcoin wallet. And boom, they were into the Bitcoin wallet and they were able to reco 2.4 million of the, of the money back. Now, dark sites has been quote unquote down uh, since this, uh, this operation. And uh, it has just sent, all the groups are just going crazy after this because it's, this is the first time that we've really seen the Bureau reach out and use RICO against these guys effectively. And it, you know, Season 2.4 million back from these guys out of the blockchain was a big deal, very big deal. So FBI is not done yet. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I had lunch well, last week with a couple of guys from the Bureau, um, and they were talking about some of the operations that are going on. There's going to be some more coming. Uh, the Biden administration, obviously, you know, this gets press, and they're going to give it some, uh, some attention uh, because of the press. And so these, these groups are going to be under some pressure, and they're responding. So groups have stated that they're shutting down. So it, are they? No, they're not. They're not going to walk away from money like this. The Abaddon group said that, okay, we're ceasing operations, and they gave all their private keys to bleepingcomputer.com. There's no way in the world these guys are walking away from this kind of money. They're just going to retool, and they're going to go out and reorganize. Already seeing it. We found new sites up, the new shame sites called Vice Society. And a, uh, a site called Marketo popped up that claimed it was the uh, auction site, the, the whole clearinghouse for stolen data. Uh, Marketo's down right now. I checked it this morning. Um, it's getting a lot of attention. But we're also, you know, you're, we're going to see these groups rebrand and rethink themselves. We're also starting to see, we knew this was coming after dark side group uh, attacks that are appearing to be lone wolves. They're not. They're not. They're not identifying themselves. They're not, they're not going to be acting like, oh, hey, we're going to. I mean, Abaddon had a really cool looking logo and dark side out. They're not going to identify themselves as a group. The reason for that is if you commit a crime in the furtherance of a criminal syndicate or a criminal structure, like a gang or anything like that, RICO can be used against you. That was designed back in the day to take down you know, um, Al Capone and the mafia. Well, they're using it against these groups. So now they've realized, wait a minute, we don't want to have these shame sites with, with uh you know, so, so, hey, we're this group or we're that group. We want to, you know, we're going to not stop that. You're going to see a lot more loosely organized individuals on the surface, but behind them, that organization structure is still there. They're just not going to say who they are. They're, communi they're changing their communication tactics. Uh, the Phobos group went to a completely encrypted chat portal. You can't even see the chat histories. It's all encrypted. So you only you can send and you can see the one that's sent to you. And after that, it's all encrypted. Uh, this is in the response to what they're, they're, they think is going on and what information they have about what we do. Because we, we collect all these chats that we do and we watch the different verbiage that these guys are using and the way they talk to us. 
each group is different, right? They all have their version of broken English, uh, but within the groups, each individual person that we're on the other end of the computer acts differently towards us. And we know, we can tell when we're in a chat, when somebody else takes over on the keyboard. And if we got some, if we're, if we're dealing with somebody who's just a jerk and we see somebody, okay, switch over, I hey, then we move quicker to try to get that person because they'll make us a better deal or something like that. Um, it's this, this ransomware, you know, ransom is going up. You guys saw this thing with Kaseya over the weekend. Uh, our evil son Okabe stated they wanted 7 million globally. That's a prime example. These guys are trying to fortify their war chests. They want to get as much money in there, get it protected, get it moved out of the blockchain, get it into bank accounts before that something happens and they get rico They get $2.4 million taken from them. They're scared to death of that. Okay. So that's what's going on right now with, uh, with the groups. The other thing we're seeing is re-extortion. They're, they're digging in their heels. They'll say, oh yeah, pay me $40,000 and I'll give you the keys. So you pay them $40,000, $40, they come back and say, oh, sorry, um, I want another $40,000 more. We're seeing a lot of that right now. Uh, this 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 Kaseya attack with our evil sword and Okabe, this is their, their tactics in this attack are completely different than anything that this group has ever done. They've never hit anything like this. Typically when our evil or sword and Okabe comes in, they're going to take data and they're going to they're going to extort it for every last dime they can. In this hit here, they haven't taken any data that we know of, and they are not threatening to publish any data from this Kaseya attack. Absolutely insane. So, but they're charging upwards of forty-five to fifty thousand dollars per unique file extension on the encrypted files. Um, we've had clients that had seven, to, uh, seven to ten different unique file encrypted file extensions. 50 each, 500 grand to get everything decrypted. Uh, they have not been negotiating. They have been flat out, no. That tells me that they're trying to get as much cash as they can and they're quote unquote going to shut down. So threat vectors. Listen, uh, a lot of this stuff you guys understand and know, but drive by, scan and attack. These guys are constantly scanning. They're ne they never stop. They're always looking for a crack. Uh, that's what happened when was Experian didn't patch a, uh, an Apache strut server. Boom, in. And that, that's all it takes. They are they're opportunistic. Um, they will not stick to just one technique. They've learned over time that, you know, you really limit yourself uh, if you're using one technique. So they, they will use whatever they can get their hands on. Um, they're constantly buying information on the dark web. They're constantly looking for zero days they can get their hands on. Um, the odds are that our evil Stone Okabe did not find this Kaseya zero day. They actually bought it and then exploited it. You know, old applications, uh, unpatched, vulnerable programs. They're all, you know, remote services, uh, RDP, uh, team viewer. Those things, they're always, they're pounding the heck out of these things. Uh, they're, they're in there at all times. Um, we've seen them go after uh, Fortigate had a problem with their VPNs. There was a vulnerability if you didn't patch it. And it, we've seen, we've had more than one client come in because they didn't patch that that thing in time, and boom, they got in. Anytime you put a hardware addition, I've seen uh, we've had a couple of clients that you know stood up hardware um, before getting it secured, and boom, they hit them. You know, phishing emails, this and that's been around forever. It's never going to go away. You know, that's they're they're looking at the human side of things. If you if you send my wife an email that says click here for a free Amazon gift card, she's clicking on it. I, I guarantee you that that's going to happen. Supply chain, chain compromises are, are a big deal. That's what happened in the Target hack. Their HVAC vendor, their AC vendor was vulnerable and they had a connection to the Target enterprise network. They got into the AC vendor because they didn't have the same security standards that Target did. Boom. And you guys, we all know what happened at that. Well, we heard the heck of it. That was, that was nightmarish. I got a cousin that works in the, the legal department at, uh, at Target and it was a nightmare for those guys. Uh, so I know uh, that Target, you know, they're big enough to go ahead and you know survive a hit like that, but a lot of clients aren't. And then valid accounts. There's so many dumps. Oh my God! If you look at my name on the on the dark web, you're gonna find me all over the place. There's so many data dumps anymore. For somebody to say, "Well, my my information is not out there," that's that's not true. You're out there. 
if you've purchased a house or a car after Experian and Equifax, all these guys get hit, you're out there. The DOD got hit, you're you're out there. Your information is on the web. I just got a letter from Capital One yesterday saying, oh, we've turned down your uh, credit card application. Well, that's because I have my credit file locked. My wife is a retired fraud detective. Of course, I have my credit, my, my credit file locked. And they weren't able to get in. Why? Because my name's out there. My stuff's out there. It's just the way society is these days. Ransomware. Here's the, uh, the official definition of ransomware. It's rather long. Uh, I like to use and tell people that ransomware is nothing more than a way of making sure you can't use your stuff. And uh, that's really what it boils down to. There's a lot of different uh, encryption variations. Some will use elliptical. Um, some are using Diffie-Hellman. I mean, there's so, there's so many different ways to encrypt. The key to it all is a lot of people are looking for that universal decryptor. And these guys have learned to make sure that you do not use the same key twice, ever. They've learned that. How does it work? The old phishing email. We all, I mean, we're on information security. So this, this is what keeps us up at night because you know somebody's going to click on that, on that Excel and it's going to fire off a macro. And that macro is going to call out to a C2 server. And that C2 server is going to download Cobalt Strike and Cobalt Strike's going to open a beacon and away we go. And it, this is absolutely insane. It's not going to go away. Um, there is no tool out there that you can say, hey, I'm good. I'm good. It doesn't work that way. We, there, for every tool that's put up and every every defense we set up, there's some nerd in his mom's basement or in a windowless room in North Korea or Russia that's trying to figure out how to get around that tool. And they're going to. There's there, there's no sure thing here. I, we once had a client says, Keith, I need you to write me a letter that says that we're 100% secure. Can't do that. There is no such thing as 100% secure. You know, my, my network here at home is not 100% secure. My kid hacks it all the time. That's what I get for having an autistic kid. She can get into anything. So we are definitely, definitely seeing a lot more sophisticated attacks. This Kaseya attack, yeah, that's huge. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, uh, when Hafdium got into that, interesting. I, I don't know what Hafdium's endgame was in that. They had a hook into how many systems? We saw very little data exfiltration on those systems. We saw maybe a handful get locked up with ransomware, but really I don't understand what half end endgame was. Maybe they got interrupted before they were able to fire, fire off a ransomware campaign or a, a data exfiltration campaign. Not sure, but that one was weird. Uh, business impacts are huge, absolutely huge. You, you, you get in one of these things, you're bleeding money. You're bleeding money. Uh, you're down. Your, your everything, your finance, payroll, any retail operations, it's down. And money's flying out the door because you're, you're paying us, obviously, and you're going to be getting, you have to get new hardware. You're going to have to buy, you know, it just flies out the door. This third one is the big deal, ransomware as a service. These guys are franchising their operations. And we know when we're dealing with a ransomware as a service crew because we can see it in the communications. These guys are trying to play hardball, like they're kind of, you know, big man on campus. Not, Yo, no, we're not going to do that. And, you know, we've actually had one, some where we've gone back to the original group and said, hey, you need to calm your boy down over here because uh, he's going to ruin your reputation. So that is a, that's not, I mean, that's huge. It's like the old late night, you know, you, you, you can't sleep when you're up at one o'clock in the morning and you have, hey, make money with uh, my, uh, my real estate system. I'll teach you how to become a millionaire. They're doing the same thing on the dark web. I'm trying to buy into one of these things to see what we can get into and, 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 and learn. Um, the, uh, what was it, uh, LockBit. They got into LockBit's ransomware as a service console. Some researchers did shut down LockBit. for. Uh, they haven't seen them back up yet. And data exfiltration. Last year, we maybe saw a handful of cases where they're taking data. Right now, I will tell you pretty much every case, assume they took data. Absolutely assume it. If they don't say it right away, they may come back and, and, and say, yeah, I took it. We just had a case where we, they, they settled, they got the keys, everything else. A month later, a guy comes back and goes, oh, by the way, I took your data, pay me more. And that, that's, that's what's happening right now. They want the bucks. And, and a lot of people are paying them to avoid the bad publicity. You know, there's been so many breaches right now. Uh, you know, bad publicity, it's not, as, it's not as bad as it was when Target got hit or, or Home Depot or any of those guys. But still. 
it, you know, people still freak out that there's been a breach and, and they're going, you're going to lose business. Random spray and play. That's what they're going to do. They're just throwing everything out there. Internet crime is not about ripping off one person for a million bucks. And this comes straight from a, a guy named Eric Weinstein that I arrested. Oh God, I think I hit Eric in 2009. And I was interviewing Eric and he, and he says, detective, the key to internet crime is not ripping off one person for a million bucks. It's ripping off a million people for a buck. The internet lets you do that because you can automate it. This guy was listing 35,000 things a day on eBay. He didn't have any of them to sell. And they were all five, six bucks. No one's going to see, no one's going to look at that. You get five, six bucks, yeah, whatever. And then it's not going to get much attention. And even, even from law enforcement, the only reason I got into Eric is because we got into that volume and saw that volume and eBay gave me a phone call and we, and we started working it. Targeted attacks is what everybody thinks is going on. These are more, when you start looking at nation states and you're getting involved with some very, very, very sophisticated individuals, they're going to say, I want to go hit American Express. Okay. How can I go hit American Express? I mean, it is a full on typically almost cyber warfare at this point. Uh, we've had some talks with some energy providers and they're like, well, what happens if, you know, uh, you know, like 20 energy providers on the grid get attacked? I said, that's called cyber warfare. And that means that the Biden administration is going to go, hey, cyber command, you're on. And we're, I mean, that's the way it goes. So target attacks right now, we don't see a ton of them. We typically see these random attacks where it's just spray and pray, see if they can get in the door and go. But if you have a large you know, or some very, very valuable information. Uh, you work for Atheon or General Dynamics or something like that. Yeah, you're going to get targeted and you need to be working on a, defending a targeted attack and a random attack at the same time because Lord knows things happen. What do we do? The old defense and debt stuff. This comes right from CISSP, guys. Um, nothing crazy, but it's always good to go back over it and, and, and think about it. You know, antivirus. I cannot tell you how many clients come to us and they're only running antivirus. That's all they got. Antivirus and a firewall. And time and time again, I would say probably, oh, probably 99.8% of our clients, that's all they've got running. Signature-based stuff is, is done. These guys are using polymorphic malware. And what they've done is they've taken the old Drydex and TrickBot and all these things and they expand the code and add 100 to 200 bytes. And then they just random generate in, that, in those 200 bytes. Boom, you change the file signature, antivirus is pretty gone. That's where you get into the old endpoint detection and response tools, the crowd strikes, the carbon blacks. These are ones that are monitoring and watching for goofy behavior. One of the tools that we see these guys use all the time is they will fire off a Basin 64 encoded script to bring up Cobalt Strike into memory and start the beacon. Well, a Basin 64 coded script will set off an alert and CrowdStrike, a little every time. I've used CrowdStrike at both CBS and American Express, and if any time a base 64 goes, it's going to hit. You should never turn that one off because I'm telling you right now, that's one of the favorite techniques of the bad guys is they will use base 64 encoded scripts. They think by encoding it, we're not gonna see it. That tells you, wait a minute, something happened on this machine. Now you need to watch that machine. Cobalt Strike is an old pen, is a pen test tool that got out into the environment. We saw a cobalt strike on five cases a year ago. Now, every case, it runs in RAM. It leaves very little, if any, forensic evidence on the, uh, on the hard drives. Absolutely a pain in the butt. You can sit there and basically it's just like having an open pipe right into the computers, right into your networks once that beacon is up and running. And it's very difficult to detect. One of the things that we look for is we look for the tools that come in to deploy cobalt strike. That tells us what's been going on. But if data's flying out the door in a cobalt strike beacon, doesn't leave anything on the, on the hard drive. Doesn't leave anything on the hard drive. Most of your EDRs right now are detecting the cobalt strike beacon and it'll flat, you know, there should be a siren and red lights and everything. When I was running the, the security operations center for, for Amex, I put a sign up on the wall that said, any day we're not on Krebs is a good day. The rest of these are pretty simple stuff. Vulnerability management, patch management. You need to be looking at your network. You need to be looking for holes. You need to be looking for things. There, it, it, I'm an old man and I've only had one cup of coffee this morning. So I can't remember everything that's going on in my network. So it's always good to go in and let's, 
let's take a look at what's vulnerable, let's to make sure we're patching, get a pen test done. Um, one of the things that we are seeing is very, very, very fruitful for organizations is purple team. Don't just, you know, red team is fun. You know, if you're the red team, it's fun. If you're the blue team, it's not that much fun. So a purple team, we bring in the red team to sit right next to the blue team. And while they're hitting you, you should, they're talking to you about what you should be seeing and vice versa. I did one of these when I was at Amex and it was, my guys loved it. They absolutely loved it. They sat down, the, the, the pen testers were like, hey, I'm firing off Metasploit. And the guy's like, I see it. Okay. And then, you know, we were working from there and it really, really trained up these guys like that. User trading. It, it, let's face life, man. The, the human factor. I could tell my wife, stop clicking on those links. She's going to click on them. It's going to happen. Heck, I even designed phishing training that I caught myself and I had to go to remedial phishing training that I put together. Disaster recovery. We all know disaster recovery. Here's the difference with disaster recovery. What we see from clients is, yeah, they've got backups and they've got a disaster recovery plan, but they never test it. And then something happens and now, oh crap, it's going to take me a week just to restore a couple of backups because they don't know, they've never had that Train like it's like it's real, man. Train like it's real. Take some time. Run through a scenario. Make sure you can get back up from your backups. Well, yeah, we've got them. We we know what to do. But there, with anything else, you fire up the you know the blue bar starts going across and something goes boom. Okay, make sure that that's going on in there. And we talk to uh, you know I talk to CIOs and CEOs all the time, and it's like, well, when is this going to be done? When is this going to be done? You don't know, man. You don't know because there's way too many variables to control during one of these incidents to try to tell you, listen, this is going to take two days. It could take 10 minutes. It could take a week. You know, when I'm processing forensic evidence, I've seen things be done processing in less than a day, and I've seen things take over a week. So it's, there's all these different variables that you can't control. And obviously, cyber insurance is a, is a big, big deal to help cover some of these costs. They are just... they. they Literally, I cannot tell you guys how fast our clients are bleeding money. Multi-factor. You guys hear a lot about multi-factor, and I did a talk with Hanover Insurance a while back. Um, a lot of people think multi-factor is, is the, that's the key. If you have multi-factor, you're done. Not really. What about a zero day? There's been multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication that's had, that's had problems, that has had holes. Is it a great tool? Absolutely. Awesome tool. But it's not the end all be all. And uh, the insurance industry was talking about, oh, yeah, multi factor, multi factor, multi factor. Just standing up multi factor is not going to protect you completely. You still need the rest of the tools. You still need these things because something's going to get around. Something's going to get past that multi factor. These guys are constantly working on different techniques to get past it. Antivirus. We talked about that, the polymorphic stuff. Every group is using polymorphic every time that their tools get downloaded from the command and control servers, it's got a different file signature. You've got to bring more up from than just uh, antivirus. EDRs, this is where it's at, guys. Um, this is, these are the tools that now that are, are probably the best in class. Uh, we use CrowdStrike. We partner with CrowdStrike here at Kivu. Um, I've used CrowdStrike in, in large environments. It's, it's very, very good. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, solid product, and it helps protect uh, and the thing about it is, is if something gets past everything and it affects a machine, it's a, you can isolate that machine with a keystroke. Think it's isolated. So now instead of having 50 computers infected, you have one. That really is the key. It's like, okay, somebody's going to get in the door. You're just going to slam the door on them and, and cut off their heads. Disaster recovery. The plan is the key. Uh, and I'm aging myself with the reference to the, uh, the A-team there. I'm absolutely aging myself with reference to A-team. But the bottom line is, is the big problem that we see is, yep, we got a plan. But when was the last time you, you, you ran a test on it or you tried to recover? Uh, we never have. And things pop up and things go boom during the, the backup process. You know, automated backups are great, you know, but there's always, there's always something. The three, two, one rule. Even my wife has figured this one out. And she is the most untechnical person in the world. That woman could break an iPhone. Three copies of your data, one in production one in the online backup for business continuity in case the system crashes. That last one, one offline for disaster recovery, that's the key. If you're using something like Veeam, great tool, man, great tool. But if it's still online, 
and the bad guy sees it, he, they're all over it. They're going to encrypt that sucker or they're going to delete it. You're done. You got to pay them because you don't have any more backups. If you keep that one copy offline where the bad guy can't see it, there's no connection from your network to that copy of the disaster recovery backups, you're golden. Now you can start bringing those things in, start bringing everything back up to speed. You can get back up running a heck of a lot quicker. And you don't, make, you don't have to pay a ransom at that point. You don't have to pay. So obviously the frequency of the data is based on how much can you guys risk losing and still be able to function. Is that, you know, hey, I can lose a week. Hey, Saturday night at two o'clock in the morning, let's run a full backup, kick it offline to maybe you know, throw it in AWS or something like that, and then close that net, close that hole and then get back to work. Here's what it looks like, cyber insurance. If you guys get hit, you're gonna call your cyber insurance company. They're gonna call a breach coach. The breach coach are attorneys that are, this is what they do. They're all about the privacy laws. They're all about the regulations and they're gonna walk you through that. They're gonna call us, hopefully us, right? And they're gonna get, we're gonna get started. Do we need to talk to the bad guys? We're, we're gonna sit on a scoping call and we're gonna say, all right, where are you guys at? You guys tell me, hey Keith, listen, I've got backups. Um, it's gonna take me a week or so to get re recovered from backups. Can you buy me some time? Excellent. My team's gonna get a hold of these guys. We're gonna start talking to them and we're gonna start dragging these things out. Just making it, you know, drag, 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 drag to get you that time. Or if you come up and tell me, say, Keith, I don't have any backups. They deleted them. We're completely burnt down and we're losing a million dollars a day. All right, we're going to speed that thing up. You're not going to get the best price because obviously the longer we can negotiate and work these guys over the, the best we can. But we're going to get you those keys as quickly as possible for the best price we can. And, you know, we're going to, we always make these guys prove, number one, you got to prove what they pay, for, you know, that they can decrypt. You get what you pay for. And we, we know all these different groups. For example, the Phobos group, their decryptors stink, absolutely stink, because we, we only see maybe 60 to 65% file recovery. And that's after going back three or four times and getting re-extorted three or four times with this junk that these guys are putting out. So we can help you with all that. We have our forensic team, our instant response teams. They're going to come in and they're going to look at all the evidence. We have a, a, a tool we created called Tech. Where the hell was this was when I was working all those cases at two o'clock in the morning, imaging computers, I should have smacked my old boss, but it collects just the logs we need and only the logs that we need and leaves it so we can scalpel through these, this information as quickly as possible and get to patient zero, tell you guys what happened, see what data was taken and get the answers to the attorneys so that you guys can make the legal moves that you need to make. Should you pay? Well, there's a lot of things. I mean, the FBI says, Never pay it. Well, that's great. You know, and when I was a cop, I never pay. But when you're burnt down and your business is basically done and 500 people are out of a job, you know, it's not as simple as that. And I understand that now. Um, we can't pay some people. The uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, has sanctioned a couple of groups, uh, one of them being Evil Corp. Uh, and you're going to see there's some articles running around I found on LinkedIn. I said that our evil Sotonokabe is linked to Evil Corp. We have never seen that. I don't know where this reporter got that information. I challenged her on it on, on LinkedIn. I haven't heard back from her, but our evil Sotonokabe has been uh, in place for a long time. And we know the, no connection to that because Evil Corp, who is another group, yeah, they're sanctioned. They're, they're, there's, there's sanctions against them, and you cannot pay anybody that may have links to Evil Corp. You cannot pay anybody that has links to Iran, Cuba, North Korea. So we, that's a big deal. And we take that very seriously here. We go through a, a, an investigation just to, just to determine that. GDPR, PCI, uh, AHIPA, these kind of things. What kind of regulations are there? Under HIPAA rules, and this is coming from the attorneys, the breach coaches, they told me that even having a ransomware event is considered a breach, period, whether they took data or not. And uh, so there's, but there's some legalities and those, that's what those breach coaches are for. I, I tried to read like the California... Uh, privacy and notification laws. I, I woke up three days later. I don't know what happened. Business factors. This is the thing. How long can you survive? Listen, you know, Target's got all kinds of resources. It's a huge corporation. They could survive that hit. Can your cor can your organization survive a hit like that? You know, that that is you know that's a question that you have to think about. Technical factors. One of the things that a lot of the CEOs and the CFOs and all the, you know, the, the C-suite do not understand is if you buy these keys, it's not like 
here's the key, you run it and all the lights come on and everything's fine. That's not the way it works. Minimum, minimum, if you pay for decryption keys and tools, you've got a minimum of at least a week. It just destroys databases, corrupt files, connections are dead. You, there's so much that you have to fix, even after decryption, that at a minimum, it's going to be a week. And there's no way around that. There, there's, there's, you cannot throw enough people at it. The computers only run so fast. If you've got a two terabyte database that you need to decrypt, you're going to be there for a while decrypting it. The little, the little, the little green bar is going to be real slow running across the screen. I wouldn't bet on that one. So these are the likelihood of decryption succeeding. That's what we watch. We talk to all of our clients and say, how much did you guys get back? Oh, we got like 95% of our files back. Great. We make a note. You know, so that way we know, hey, this group, 95% comes back. This is the time for question, guys. Uh, just fire them out there. Um, you know, like I said, I've been uh, involved with law enforcement on the federal side, on the task force, on the local side, state side. Um, we've arrested a ton of these guys. You know, we're in the, my, my team is, is, is into the chat rooms in the dark web. We're watching these guys. We're talking to them on a daily basis. Um, I have yet to have any send me a case of vodka, but I have asked, but you know, I have yet to have anybody send me a case. So fire away. Oh, come on, guys, you got to have something for me. So you either hey. scare them to death, Keith, or... <laughs> Or something. <laughs> I heard someone. Hey, this is Dave Burlingame. Um, I had a bad connection in the, the beginning of this, is I, and I see that this recording has, uh, or that this session's been recorded. Can I get a copy or access to it so I can hear the first part? Yes, sir. Um, David, Michael is hoping to be able to pull these down and upload them to YouTube. Um, he said this weekend. So, okay. Yeah, we'll uh, hopefully that, get that there. Guys, seriously, you know, um, you, my information is on the screen. Brian has mm -hmm. it. We can get it to you guys. If you guys have questions, questions are free. My team is always available to assist anybody with questions about these ransomware groups. Um, it, it's forever changing. Don't, don't ever feel, not going to charge you time. Send a question. We'll take care of you. Man. If for someone looking to get into the field of what you do, particularly threat intelligence, where would you recommend starting? SANS has got a really good threat intelligence course. Um, it's, and it's a good place to start. You know, their courses are expensive, but we all know that they're pretty damn good training. That's a good place to start because there's a lot of different tools out there. There's some open source tools, some OSIN stuff, and then there's also some you know, paid for platforms. And just having the knowledge of what's out there and you know some, some hands-on to, to start using it is, is key. You know, the hard part about threat intelligence is there's so much of it and a lot of it is a repeat of what somebody else said to try to get it vetted down into something that you can use so i would start with something like that um the other thing is there's a ton of blogs out there i mean we all know about krebs um brian's brian writes some really good stuff um met the guy a few times uh really got a lot of insight into these threat actors uh bleeping computer is a good source um you can get on the dark web, but obviously there's no Google for the dark web. So you're going to have to put, hunt and poke around a little bit and see what you can find. We've gotten into some chat rooms on, uh, that are in Russian. Uh, so I have to you know, use Google Translate a lot. But you know, start with something like that um, just from a threat intelligence standpoint. Uh, look at the MISP, M-I-S-P, the MISP server. It is a free tool that you can get feeds into. It's open source. Very great tool. And uh, that's, that's where I would give it, go to get started on it. Thank you, sir. Oh, anytime. Hey, this is Bob Carr. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just appreciate it, man. Keith, that, that's, a, that's a good start for us, not technical security people. Um, but I think it's, it's, this, this, this environment you just described is kind of challenging nowadays because of all these work from home, uh, especially people bringing their work laptop at home and come the next day to the office and all those things um, will open doors for all these guys. Um, I'm working on the uh, healthcare system and that's one of the, nowadays, one of the most targeted 
beside the banks. Um, so what do you, what, what's your recommendation? What, what you feel about it? With Number all this one, COVID thing going and going on and. Well, right now, my, my first thought is that uh, investing in commercial real estate is bad. I would not do it right now because people, people don't want to go back to the office. And the number one thing is nothing touches your network that you do not have security control over ever, period. Okay. Um, we've seen clients before that, that are allowing their, client, you know, their, their workers to use their personal laptops to connect into their network. No, 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 no. Get a gold image with all your security tools on it. Make sure everything across the board has all your security tools, VPN. Nothing touches your network without a VPN ever. Okay, make sure that you're patching the hell out of that VPN because FortiGate just had a problem with theirs. But VPN, I have seen uh, when I was at American Express, we were looking at going to a VDI environment where we were going to be giving our work from home people, basically a, a dumb terminal. And all that terminal could do is it could connect to one IP and it would spin up a VM. And at the end of the day, when they were done and they shut down, it killed that VM and that dumb terminal couldn't do anything else. Uh, that's expensive, but that's an option. The other thing is, is we have, I, we, we have seen some clients and I know some organizations that will go to their work from home and set up their networks for them and make sure that they're secure. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they bring the, the modem in and they put a, you know, a, it could be God knows what kind of router they're using, um, but they don't have any security set into it. They're not even using, you know, WPA. They're using completely, or the, the thing is so old, it's ancient. And uh, so getting control and putting some of the controls on that is, you know, if somebody wants to work from home, you know, you, you need to help them out a little bit with that from an organization standpoint. Um, so we have seen some organizations do that. To tell you how bad it can be, I was at CVS. We had a work from home employee that was living in Iowa that was using dial up to a party line. And that's all HIPAA information at, at CVS. So, yeah, it's, it is a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. Um, I know that there are some companies that are working on some new products that are coming out that uh, for this very challenge, but I don't think it's they're mature enough yet to be deployed. So first things first, make sure that anything touches that touches your network has your security tools on it and can be monitored and nothing connects unless it's with VPN. Hey Keith. Um, Thank you. Going off of uh, Luke's question, uh, for someone who is not currently in InfoSec, but looking to transition into it from a different field, um, but targeting moving into CTI, into threat intel, what kind of path would you um, recommend there? Is there, you know, spending some time in a SOC first, or what would you recommend as kind of the stepping stones to move into CTI? I think it would, I think spending some time in a SOC to start out is the key. I teach at the University of Advancing Technology here in Phoenix. I tell all the guys there, Go get, your, go get your foot in the door of the sock. Now you're seeing everything live time. And it gives you a great reference point to move into CTI because you've seen the actions of the people that you're studying, okay? You've seen what they're doing. <clears throat> to start out just in CTI alone, you're missing that operational component, okay? I'm a big fan of General uh, Stanley McChrystal. He wrote the book called Team of Teams. And uh, General McChrystal is the guy who hunted down El Zakarwi in, in Iraq. And when he got to Iraq, they had a problem. You had all the Intel people over here doing their thing. Then you had the SEAL team operators and, and Delta over here doing their thing. And they were both barking at each other because the Intel guys are giving out old Intel and the, um, and the operators are like, hey, we're getting wiped out out here because of your old Intel. And, you know, and the Intel guys are like, well, you're giving us you know, hard drives and crap. We don't even know where it came from. So what McChrystal did is he made the uh, Intel people go out on some of the raids with the operators. And he made the operators go sit down with the Intel people. If you watch the movie Zero Dark Thirty after they killed Bin Laden in the movie, you'll see the SEAL Team 6 bagging and tagging everything. That's because of what General McChrystal did. So that operational and you know, being able to mesh operations and intelligence like that is the key. So I would start in a SOC, get your foot in the door of the SOC, start looking at what's going on, watch the attacks going on live time, see the techniques these guys are doing, then start moving into threat intelligence from there. The SOC is, I think, is the key to any career in uh, information security. Start there and then, hey, I like doing this or I like doing that. And you can work your way through it. Thanks. No problem, man, anytime. Hey, Keith, you specifically mentioned uh, CrowdStrike. 
and um, um, the other one. Um, uh, carbon black. Those carbon black. Yeah. Uh, what about others? Um, the, the Microsoft ATPs, um, uh, the other products in that. Are there any that um, you specifically do or don't and like and why? You know, I don't, I don't know. The reason I talk about CrowdStrike and Carbon Black are those are the two that I'm most familiar with and that I've used in, in, in defending in, in enterprise environments. Um, there's a lot of really good tools out there. Microsoft AP, ATP, Microsoft is really working hard to bring up their security level. Um, we've had some clients have pretty good luck with that. Um, uh, Sentinel One, I've seen some really good things coming out of Sentinel One. So there's a lot of really great tools out there. As long as the tool is number one, it can be monitored. And it's not just looking at file signatures, it's looking at file behaviors and process behaviors. That's a start. Um, the CrowdStrike Falcon platform, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big interface guy, okay? If it takes me 80 clicks or I have to write 27 command lines to try to get the information, that's wasting time. And during an incident, time is of the essence. So if that interface does something like that, that's a big factor to me. And that's something to take a look at when you're dealing with these things. How is that information being presented to your people so you can take action quickly? Because the quicker I go, that's bad. And you can hit that isolate button, the better. That's the big factor when I'm looking at it. Because a lot of these things are really really close to what they can do in, 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 in scope. It's, but to me, I think that easy use is key. So um, I wouldn't say there's any one that I would stay away from or anything like that, or, or that I would endorse. I just talk about CrowdStrike and Carbon Black because I'm very familiar with those interfaces um, because I've used both of those in, in large environments. Thanks. Anytime. Yeah, absolutely, guys. David, just a comment there. So I was talking, talking to our, uh, our managed services person this morning, um, and, and he has done a, an, an ATP, or an APT, sorry, simulation between two of those products, Sentinel-1 and, um, and CrowdStrike. Um, and the only reason I make the comment is he said, during that simulation, CrowdStrike detected 13 more um, you know, events of, of that simulation than Sentinel one. So there definitely is, there are differences between the products and they are going to catch different things. Um, you know, they're, they're, and we, we partner with Sophos for more of those smaller businesses that may not be able to, to go with a CrowdStrike type play. Um, they're all going to be different. Um, but I think at the end of the day, to, to a point Keith made earlier, one of those you know, whatever you choose that is an EDR platform is going to be better than not having an EDR platform. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry, Ryan, that you had to talk to Mullins this morning. That's never good for sitting there on a day talking to that dude. We, we, we give each other crap. We have to make each other smile around here because there's some long days and some long nights. So I was up to four o'clock in the morning the other night doing some communications. And I'm an old man. I can't be doing that anymore. Keith, I appreciate your time today. Um, I just had a question about where you see uh, a lot of the countries that are attacking. I mean, you hear a lot about Russia and Romania, so I just wonder if you saw a lot of other countries as well that were big players that we should look out for that maybe don't get as much media attention. You know, um, most of our guys, we call it Kiev time. That's the joke around my team when we're talking to these guys. It's because they come from that old Eastern Bloc, the old Soviet Bloc. Now, a, I was in the military in the 80s. That was the evil empire back then, right? And when, after everything broke up, that's where we see a lot of these guys come from. I've actually been able to listen to these guys when they, they called one of our victims and left a voicemail. And it, they're absolutely from that area. So I would say anything coming out of, you know, if it's got Stan in the name or way too many consonants that I can't pronounce, and I'm not trying to be funny. I can't pronounce half of those countries' names. I just can't. Uh, well, Azerbaijan, uh, yeah, all that. Serbia, Bosnia, um, that whole area. Nigeria is very active. The old princes are at it, man. They figured out they can make money on this one. Um, we have seen Argentina on a couple of cases. Uh, the problem being is that with VPN services out there, I can look like I'm coming from anywhere. So that, that's the big issue is that with the VPN, uh, it looks like I'm coming coming from the Netherlands. Well, the Netherlands is not a, is not a traditional uh, adversary, but we do see a lot of activity coming out of the Netherlands lately off of VPN services. 
So it's very difficult. Um, I tell, we tell clients a lot that if, listen, if you don't do uh, business outside the United States, geoblock. Geoblock. When I was at CVS, we geoblock. There's not a CVS store in China, Russia, or Europe. Geoblock. Anything that comes from outside the United States, uh uh-uh, ain't happening. And uh, so that, was, that one was easy. American Express, that was a little bit more difficult. So. All right, thanks. Hey, Keith. Oh, this is Adam. I got a question for you. Sure. Um, uh, just to clarify, um, you typically work with cyber insurance companies, but, but you, you guys don't provide insurance. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't provide insurance. We're not, we're not that big. Uh, we, but we, the, the cyber insurance companies will hire the breach coaches in us. Um, because you have to be on the, uh, the board or the, the, the panel or whatever they call it. Um, and you have to be approved by the cyber insurance company. And then I think we're on everybody's panel. We've been on a long time. So we're on pretty much everybody's panel. And then they bring us in. Excellent. So, um, but, so I'd, I'd imagine you, you probably, you know, typically work with them or at least with your customers and everything. So the, the question I have is about cyber, cyber security insurance and basically what insurance will look like in the next five or 10 years. Um, you know, right, right, right now, you know, there's a thought that having insurance may incentivize cyber criminals to kind of engage, knowing that a company may have, you know, kind of the financial backing to pay the ransomware. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I would agree with that. Um, I think that it is a factor, but I don't think it's the only factor. I think overall, these groups know about cyber insurance from a, you know, an umbrella standpoint. Um, but I don't think having a, having insurance it's not like these guys have a list of who has insurance and who doesn't, right? They don't have that kind of information. Um, I know that cyber insurance is changing. Um, I had a call with the vice president of cyber for Hanover Insurance, and the way that they write these policies is changing um, because they're, they're, they're losing money on these things left and right. Insurance companies don't like to lose money. Um, they're gonna, I think what you're going to start seeing is, is in order to get a cyber insurance policy, you're going to have to meet some minimum standards as far as security posture goes. Um, I see that coming rather quickly. Uh, I know they're really talking about MFA and you know, at, at a minimum MF, having MFA involved, which I mean, hey, MFA is great, but it's not the end of the deal. And that's why I was talking to them about that. So I think you're going to see some stuff start to pop up on, on that side of it. Um, but I think in this case here, I think having not having cyber insurance would be the risk of that would be far outweigh uh, uh, the risk of getting hit. I mean, I, I would not go without it. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, that, that was, you actually kind of touched on the follow-up question to that, which is, you know, my kind of understanding is that, you know, a lot of these companies, you know, when, it, when there's a catastrophic event, you know, they, they can, it can contribute to the insurers leaving the market, um, you know, entirely. And, and kind, of, kind of the idea of where there's, you know, no, they're not able to, or aren't imposing any kind of obligations or at least can't prove like, you know, it's not like they're collecting data to show, you know, what we are and aren't doing, um, uh, uh, or, you know, that, 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 that we're following any kind of best practices, you know, as a policy holder. So, um, so yeah, yeah, that, that, that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And I know, I know that Ryan and his team, uh, you know, they deal with the carriers all the time and they're trying to get us in front of these characters you know, to try to in- influence a little bit of that also um, because, it's all about the information you get, right? And, you know, square shooting is the way to go. And that's what I, t- I told the guys from Hanover. I said, listen, here's the deal. MFA is cool, but there's ways around MFA. And you got to have some more some more tools in there. We talked, we actually, the same same style of presentation, not the same one, but I, I talked about a lot of these different tools with them. So I would expect them to start bringing that stuff up, you know, um, but they're not, I would, honestly, I see them saying, listen, if you don't have this minimum baseline, we're not going to insure you. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and, I agree. And talking to some of these insurers and having folks on our team who who work in the insurance space, MFA, um, most insurers now consider an uninsurable risk. So if you don't have it, they will not insure you. Um, they're seeing a lot of changes as far as how policies are written. Um, there's a lot of talk with breach coaches about if ransomware itself is called out in a policy, um, if they if insurers will continue to provide coverage for that. Um, you're seeing large companies who are, are really starting to, um, in some cases, self-insure, and they have really high caps. Um, a lot of the smaller businesses where insurance companies are just killing it and making a ton of money in premiums, um, you know, they typically have pretty low retentions and low caps. Um, but on that end, you're, you're paying a lot 
for that type of policy. So um, th- there's a there's a lot going on in the cyber insurance space. Like he said, they're they are bleeding money um, oh. heavily. But on the on the flip side of that, premiums are going up for for everyone. And I, I think last year or this year, your premiums have increased, you know, 50 percent since last year. So, you know, that puts organizations, small organizations in a really tough spot. Um, and, and there's a lot to weigh there from a business perspective. Yeah, and it, it's very difficult to write a cyber insurance policy because the, you know, an auto policy. Oh, my God, these guys have got data galore that they can set rates based upon all this information they have. But with cyber insurance, it's fairly new product. And the information and the threats and the, and the risks change by the minute. So this is a, this is a hard world for the insurance companies to, to, to get into. Honestly, I, 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 I could see some insurance companies going, ah, we're out of cyber. Um, we're, gonna, we're out of cyber. So it's going to be an interesting thing coming up. Um, you know, ransomware and cyber extortion is going to evolve. It'll never go away. Uh, it'll evolve. If, if the Biden administration came down today and said, you know, no paying ransomware groups, they're going to figure out a way to get around that. And there's going to be a way that, you know, they're going to make money. And that's just the way criminals are. And, you know, back in the day when I started, stolen property was sold at a flea market or to a pawn shop. Today, they're just selling it on Craigslist and offer up, right? It's just, it's an evolution and that's going to continue. It'll be really interesting to see from the insurance perspective. Um, this is like new within the past two or three weeks, but the big insurers such as AIG Access, Beasley Chubb, who hold a, a lion's share of the market share for cyber policies, they just started a new consortium um, called Cyber AccuView. And the goal of that, you know, from my understanding, is to really compile a lot of that data to try and understand trends, risks, things like that, um, to one, help policyholders, but then obviously they need to understand the data collectively to make better po- or decisions for the their market in general so um you know it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that yeah it's so it you know it's going to be in an ever evolving place i would definitely keep an eyeball on it um you know it's not like like my homeowner's policy i, I just you know it goes away until you know, one of our haboobs comes in and rips my roof off. But, um, you know, it's going to be different. We're going to have to keep an eyeball on these policies and keep up on it because it's going to be changing. And the, and the, the, all of that is just is ever evolving, like Ryan said. There's so many changes. This, this environment that we work in and information security, you guys know this. It, it's never the same day to day. Every case is different. Every attack is different. Every group uses different tactics and tools. And that's what makes it extremely difficult for the insurers. Excellent. I appreciate the response. Thank you. Yeah. And if you guys ever see, uh, if you ever want to see one of our haboobs, look it up on the internet. Because I live on the south side of Phoenix, and that sucker hits me every time when it comes in. The back side of my house is a lighter shade of brown than the front side because of all the sand that's hit it over the years. All right. Any other questions for Keith before we wrap up today? I know we're at the top of the hour, but happy to go a few extra if there's any questions all right guys i'm here for you um you know my team's always available for you if you guys pick up something just send me an email say hey keith i was at your ISA, uh, presentation um I, I got this question or that question always willing to help guys i would rather talk to you guys in a situation like this or a couple of questions than during an incident and you guys are up all night drinking red bulls and monsters all right Well, that concludes uh, this month's meeting. We'll be back in August, the second Friday. Um, Make sure, like Mike said, to get your ticket for B-Signs. I saw uh, Chad drop that in the chats at the top there. And then also, uh, if you're interested in speaking, there's an open CFP. We'd love to have more folks from the Greenville area get out and talk to that. So uh, have a great rest of your week. Have a great weekend, all. Uh, We'll see you guys next month.